Hello and welcome to our, the second in our series about God's new normal. We've been hearing a lot about the new normal and that uh, reminded me that as Christians we're already living in a new normal because God has said if anyone is in Christ, if anyone's a committed Christian, there is a new creation. We live in a totally different world in a way because we're Christians. And last week we thought about the fact that there's too much anxiety about, but we can live beyond the normal level of our anxiety as we let our requests be made known to God, as we pray with thanksgiving and the peace of God guards our hearts. Well, if there's too much anxiety, there's probably not enough hope around. So today we're thinking about the fact that as Christians living in God's new normal, uh, we can overflow with hope. Paul says in Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may overflow with hope. So how can we overflow with hope? I mentioned a minute or two ago that there's a, a dearth of hope around us at the moment, particularly for us in Leicester. People were really hoping that they'd be able to go and see their relatives. They were hoping to be able to get away on holiday. They were hoping perhaps to get a dental or medical appointment because they were in significant need. And we were hoping to reopen our church for worship. All those hopes have been dashed and they drain us when our hopes are dashed. And we know that hope is absolutely vital for living as a person, let alone as a Christian. It's said that we can survive about 30 days without food, about three days without water, and hardly three seconds without hope. Hope is absolutely essential to our well-being as human beings, and we as Christians can share an overflowing hope with those around us. But how can this happen? Recently I was watching a film and it was called The Mountain Between and it told the story of Ben and Alex, two people who hadn't known one another, whose aeroplane crashed right on the top of the Rockies and they were left wondering whether they could ever get home, whether they would ever survive. There was no phone signal, nothing. And then right down in at one of the valleys, way, way beneath them, they saw a glint of light and thought, well, maybe that's a window. So courageously, they set out on this dangerous journey, slipping and sliding through the snow, crashing into rocks, all kinds of things happening to them. But eventually they discovered they were right. There was a glint of light on a window and it was a house, but it was derelict. There was no one there to help them. After a while, they recovered a bit from their dashed hopes because they heard a loud noise much further down the, the mountain slope than, than even before. And so they set out in the direction of this noise. Again, there were many risks and dangers falling through the ice into water, but they get to the place where the noise had come from. But there was no vehicle, only vehicle tracks. They were too late. Again, there was no one to help them. And then Ben traps his foot in an animal trap and so Alex has to make the journey on her own following the track. She's exhausted, she's about to give up and then again further away in the distance she leads a lot, sees a logging encampment and that just enables her to make it and eventually they're rescued. Three times there was a, a, an image, a symbol of hope which enabled them to get going and to keep going and eventually they're saved. Without that, they would probably have died. Hope is essential for us as Christians. But as with anxiety, different ones of us have different kind of natural optimism. By nature, I'm probably on a scale of one to 10 between pessimism and optimism, somewhere about three. Because of my Christian faith, I probably move up to seven to eight, but by nature, I would describe myself as a realist, not a pessimist, because I think there are so many difficulties and challenges in life and things don't always work out. 
but that's where I fit. So how can I overflow with hope when it's not my nature? Well, I like to think of it like this. Each one of us is like a newly cultivated rose. But in order for us to really thrive, that cultivar needs to be grafted into a root stock that is stronger. And as Christians, we are grafted into the very life and of Jesus. And the root stock provides stability for the rose, it provides better nourishment for the rose and greater resilience uh, to disease. The rootstock is essential if the individual rose is going to flourish. And I believe that as we live in Christ, he is our rootstock and we can receive a flow of hope that comes from God himself that we can share with others, like the fragrance and the beauty of a rose. Or think of it this way, we all need our natural human hopes to keep us going. I've just been digging some potatoes and I had hoped that with the tops growing and flourishing there would be some potatoes underneath, and there was. If there hadn't been, my hopes would have been dashed and I would have been disappointed. So we all need those hopes on the surface of our life, hopes that the meal will be good, hopes that we can meet our friends and family and so on. But underneath that surface of the waves of the sea, there is a deep flowing current, the warm current of God's love and joy and peace. And we can rest in that and be carried along by it, even when our human hopes are dashed. We have an incredible source of hope because of God. And we have this hope for ourselves as individuals because we know that God has redeemed us in Jesus, that by his grace he's going to transform us. And we have the hope that ultimately we will share an eternity with God because he has promised it. So we have this deep level hope that enables us to keep going. Paul talks about suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. We learn to live in the hope that God gives us for us. But we also have hopes for the whole of creation because God has promised that he will never again destroy the whole world. God has purposes for his creation and in the end he's going to renew creation. That's part of his great plan and another of his promises. And we can have hope for our church because Jesus promised that the gates of hell, all the powers of evil and darkness, will never overcome the community of his people that he is forming. He's promised that and so we can have hope for the future of the church. And we can have hope for our community as well, because we know God loves everyone. God wants everyone to come to faith in Jesus and experience his fatherhood, his compassion, and to begin a new and transformed life. So we have these hopes. And the way that Christian hope works is like this. It depends on the promises of God. Paul takes the example of Abraham, who was promised by God that he would have a child. And there he was. He was a hundred. He had no children. Sarah was 90. But they hung on in hope because God had promised. And eventually Isaac is born to them. Living in Christian hope depends on us grasping and living by the promises of God. But God doesn't just give us promises he gives us evidence. And so that's why at the heart of the New Testament is the thrilling, life-changing, creation-changing event that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He died for our sins and was raised to bring us into relationship with God. And he is the promise that God will fulfill all he has made. And so we can have hope 
even when things seem very, very dark indeed. We have the hope, the assurance that good is stronger than evil, that light will overcome the darkness, that sin will be forgiven. We have the hope that truth is stronger than lies because that's what the resurrection establishes and God's spirit brings that reality into our lives. But we're not just like a rose that's been grafted in, whether it wanted to or not. We have a part to play. So what's our part if we're going to have this overflowing hope that can spill out and bring joy and help to other people? Well, we need, first of all, to ask the Holy Spirit to fill us with joy and peace so that we can have that hope. We need to know the promises of God that apply to us. Now, not all the promises in the Bible apply to us. We need to be a little bit careful here, but we need to know he is the source of lasting hope and we can depend on his promises because he raised Jesus from the dead. We need to keep close to Jesus through prayer, Bible reading, and when he gives us guidance by obedience. And we need to avoid focusing our hopes entirely on short-term and perhaps self-centred issues. God calls us to be a reservoir of hope for other people, to be a fountain that overflows. We need God and other people need the hope that he can give to us. So let me pray Paul's prayer for every one of us. May the God of hope the God who is the source of all hope. Fill us with all joy and peace as we believe in him, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may overflow with hope. Lord, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ. Amen.